This segment is sponsored by Bentley Systems. Welcome to Construct Tech TV and our tech update. Today I'm going to be taking you from Toronto to California where we will explore some of the best construction projects. Today we'll be looking at the new Toyota North American headquarters, the University of California, an urban campus in Toronto, a hospital expansion in Florida, and the 50-year Old Dominion Boulevard Steel Bridge. First up, let's go to Texas. Toyota Motor North America has officially opened its spanking new North American headquarters. This builds on the company's one Toyota initiative to create a more unified operations in North America. To achieve this, it has invested about a billion dollars on the project. The spaces are designed to create a transparent environment with a focus on sustainability. Now we talk a lot about sustainability, so this campus includes seven buildings in a large central courtyard. This serves as the heart of a social and business functions. The building also meets LEED certified certification. This is due to the solar panels, rainwater harvesting system, and exterior landscaping. In order to build a project of this scale, the construction team worked together very closely. Construction included the pouring of more than 142,000 yards of concrete. It also required installation of 12 acres of glass. Now here's a fun fact. It had enough Texas limestone to equal the weight of 340 Texas-built Toyota Tundra 1794 edition trucks. In order to achieve all of this, five million hours of work were completed on this project. And at its peak, 2,000 workers were on the site daily. This is certainly one project that has demonstrated immeasurable collaboration and innovation. Sustainability is key for many buildings, especially in California. We see that the University of California, Merced, has a goal to reach net zero energy, net zero greenhouse gas emissions, and zero waste by 2020. This is in line with the university's expansion project to nearly double the campus's physical capacity by that same year. How? Think a solar power system. This will be the second solar technology used by the university. The new system will feature a carport and a rooftop installation. It will also have 5 megawatt photovoltaic system and a 500 kilowatt battery storage system. The technology will be financed by a power purchase agreement. This will help the university achieve demand change savings in the first 10 years of the project. Now that's what you call triple zero commitment. Can an urban campus be connected, innovative, and sustainable? The answer is yes, and that is what we are seeing in a new project in Toronto. CIBC Square is a public-private partnership between global real estate leaders and the city of Toronto. The square has two buildings and a one-acre elevated park over a rail corridor. Each of the buildings will be equipped with a number of amenities, including fitness, parking, and transit options. The facility is located adjacent to Toronto's Union Station. It will help complete the Union Station's campus master plan by providing direct links to all of Toronto's transit channels. This is all made possible because government and the private sector are working in tandem for the good of the community. Hospital construction projects have many tricky requirements and regulations that must be followed. And this is the case with the Florida Hospital Waterman Expansion Project. The $70 million project adds 111,000 square feet of patient care space, including expanding the emergency department to 58 beds and a 24-bed women and children's unit. Additionally, floors three and four of the new patient tower will be shelled for future growth. In addition, plans call for the structure to support an additional expansion of up to six floors. This project also includes the addition of a subgrade connecting tunnel, connecting structures, and electrical MEP upgrades. With the help of BIM, 
the project team looks to complete this project by October of 2019. Infrastructure construction projects require careful coordination and attention to detail. One recent example of this comes out of the city of Chesapeake in Virginia. The town replaced the 50-year-old Dominion Boulevard Steel Bridge. The $345 million project was completed this year. It expanded the road from the two lanes to four lanes, replaced the drawbridge, enhanced three intersections, and added a new bike path and a pedestrian walkway. The result is reduced traffic congestion, easier access, and a more efficient route for hurricane evacuation. Let's take a look inside this project to see how it all came together. Michael Baker International provided engineering and consulting services. It worked closely with the Federal Highway Administration and the Virginia Department of Transportation to verify compliance. It also provided inspection, reviewed shop drawings, and developed a, and implemented a quality assurance and quality control plan. One of the biggest challenges on this particular project was ensuring operation of the infrastructure while it was under construction. This is the case with most infrastructure projects, right? Michael Baker helped ensure maintenance of the traffic and environmental compliance on this project. The collaboration was very closely done with City Solutions to help minimize maintenance. In the end result was better infrastructure for the City of Chesapeake. That's your tech update for today. Much like every worker on the job site, every piece of equipment must serve a purpose. Still, all too often, workers don't look before they leap when using machinery on the job site. These actions are all not only irresponsible, but super dangerous. Taking an extra step to familiarize yourself with a piece of equipment can make the difference of preventing serious injuries and even fatalities. One school is driving home better safety decisions. Here to tell us all about it is Dana Atkinson, Research Associate at the Georgia Tech OSHA Training Institute. Dana, welcome to the show. It's really great to have you on today. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for having me. So let's talk about health and safety at the job site. There's so much going on, especially when you talk about all these summer months. Uh, yeah, there's lots of things. OSHA's uh, in flux right now, but there's a lot of focus that they're trying to have on, on, on the job sites, uh, both general industry and construction, and we're just trying to keep up. So what are we doing a lot right now? Is, is there more things that we need to focus with the, the construction workers that they really need to be thinking about that they haven't in the past? What's changing? Well, there's a little bit of a technology change and push coming through with BIM and other things and, and the heavy equipment and other things that are going on out there. Uh, OSHA's brought on a little bit of a focus on uh, the workers' uh, boots on the ground in regards to heat and exposures and uh, uh, the, their well-being in regards to the time they spend outdoors. Um, that's one of the focus groups we've been working on at the current time. Um, the cranes are always a big thing, the boom. I mean, outside my office here, you can see at least five or six different tower cranes in three different directions. So in the combination of those things coming together and the boom coming through and the banks coming through with the money, uh, uh, things are moving very quickly. So do you think management workers all need to work together to really focus on keeping workers safe at the job site? Is this what we really need to focus on? Absolutely. Uh, the, the, the push for production will always kind of make that whole issue with safety kind of take a little bit of a backseat. But this is really the time where they have to be uh, adamant on the aspect that they need to address those issues, especially when the boom comes through. You start getting those less experienced workers that come through that think they know or you make the assumption that they know. And uh, that's where you start having those gaps in the process that, of knowledge transfer. That's an interesting point that you say when you say that. They think they know because that always scares me because sometimes they have this training, they forget, and they start doing really, mm -hmm. sometimes I want to say, almost dumb things. They forget, and that's when the biggest injuries occur. True. There's, 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 there's two types of training. There's the formal training and informal. The informal is going to happen or not, whether or not you want it to happen or not. You have to be, uh, be proactive in dealing with that and establish the, uh, the normal protocols instead of that normal, normalization and deviation that you get through informal training peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, and especially 
the new guy, the experienced one, the one that's trying to do the best job without the most knowledge, the institutional knowledge that they should have. Uh, and it makes it difficult, especially when you start pushing production and production starts becoming a paramount as it always is, uh, unfortunately, because that's what we get paid for. But uh, uh, we're trying to work on that and, and balance it out. We're seeing a lot of uh, incidents occurring. It's not decreasing. It seems like we get more accidents in the summer months because we're rushing these projects. How do we get them to focus on being safer and avoiding, you know, when using hazardous materials or other things like that? What, what do we got to do there? Well, it's the longer days. It's the longer hours. They're out in the daylight. You have more time to get work done. You can go through and push these things through. Uh, as the construction guys like to do, they come out and get cra going to the crack of dawn. Um, they have to be uh, more diligent in making realizations of breaking the day up uh, and being adamant on when tasks change and jobs change to uh, uh, address the protocols that are needed to do the job and don't make any assumptions. Uh, but anytime you have a boom and you have more numbers and more people, you're going to see that uptick because, like I said, you're going to have this less experienced people coming in or people who are doing the quote unquote fake it till you make it uh, in certain aspects to try and, you know, just just get that check. I hate to think that we have this economic boom in construction and that leads to more, you know, injuries. But are we using and leveraging technology to kind of help us, you know, offset this boom to kind of help them kind of step back and say, let's use the advantages of where we are with technology now to maybe, you know, avoid some of these injuries? Absolutely. Um, BIM is not only for construction, but it's for work process. Uh, any part of your work process from the building to the, the task to the operations uh, should be done in the, in the design phase. And if that is the real issue with uh, design bit building and, and using these technologies. They're really much more effective in modeling in the beginning parts of your process to understand how you're going to put these projects together, what tools you'll need to operate safely, and what scope you want to try and keep your people in so they don't try and do too much. Are there other things we need to be thinking about, materials, things that are on the job site that we need to be kind of looking for right now when we're doing this big boom? True, true. Uh, uh, being down here in Atlanta, it's the issue with, with the heat and the idea that, you know, just suck it up. You'll be all right. It's, it's, it's not that hot. It was that hot for me when I worked there. Oh, you know, my gosh. You're making it, me it, laugh it, right now thinking that. I, I, it, I it just said how they how they do the things here, you know, and the rationalization of some of the chip on their shoulder about what they're going to do when it's really very simple. You just say, you know, look, water breaks, cool vests, ventilation uh, breaks in the work. You know, you, you can't all get it got, get it done by Tuesday. You know, you, you got to be able to, to uh, uh, take care of your people. But um, this is the this is the structure, the mentality we do. With the construction so we're history. looking at we all this. We, we got to get smarter, faster. I mean, is is that mentality is a bad thing. But now we got to take a step back and say, look, you've got a lot of big equipment out there. You got a lot of workers mm -hmm. on the job site. You got to think about safety. What's the big advice as we're wrapping up here? You want to give everybody to say, look, construction is important, but safety is even more important. The, the, the deal is with safety is, is, you know, when someone creates a company, at how big does that company have to get before they start considering safety? And that's all relative. And it's, is, it, is, it, is it you have that cultural moment of a humanitarian issue or an economic issue or a legality issue that forces you to focus on safety? You have to really kind of uh, – everybody – gets to it at a different point. Uh, uh, I can't go out there and preach it on the street. They have to come to us. Um, it's, it's very difficult. And sometimes I feel like in the classes I'm preaching to the choir, when people come to us, they've already in certain instances made that rationalization or had that epiphany. Um, that is the gap. That is the big issue. And there's lots of people out there that because we say OSHA and we are affiliated with OSHA, we are the bad guy. We are a consultation service. We offer consultation for small businesses. We offer training programs, and we even started an academic program of professional masters in occupational safety and health here at Georgia Tech. We're trying to address the gap that exists out there in the world in regards to people focusing on safety and making it part of the top three, production, marketing, and safety all on the same level. Dana, I wish we had more time to talk. Thank you for spending so much time with us today on Safety Zone. You're very welcome. I enjoyed it very much. Hopefully I'll see you again. All right, take care. That's our Safety Zone for today. I often talk about the Internet of Things. This week, I want to highlight a company that is putting the IoT to work in construction. The IoT is all about the aggregation of sharing of data between machines and other platforms. In the past, building owners have struggled to manage lighting and HVAC on multiple systems. 
but People's Electric is aiming to bring everything under one roof. Here to tell us all about it is Glenn Creighton, Director of Sales at People's Electric Company. Hey, Glenn, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So, Glenn, let's talk about People's Electric. Let's get in a little bit of what you guys do and a little bit of the history. It's really exciting to all, see all the things that you guys have been doing in all these years. You know, we've been around uh, in, in St. Paul since 1922. So we're almost 100 years old. So we started uh, Humble Beginnings in a little electrical shop right in downtown St. Paul. And, it, you know, we've evolved over the years. We do commercial. We do residential. We did... We did, uh, you know, uh, streets. We did uh, industrial work. And we do a lot of different types of lighting throughout the state of Minnesota and western Wisconsin as well. Um, we also are involved in communication. We're also involved in BAS. We're also involved in electrical. We're also involved in security and fire and alarm. So we have part of our unity, all these different uh, entities that uh, we can uh, give to our customers. Let's talk about that. You talked about building automation systems, BAS. How has that grown in the concept right now and how you have be able to build your apps and development and connecting to make that as a part of devices and systems? How has that been a big part of your growth for the past hundred years? Well, you know, the, the new things that are coming out, you know, as technology advances and everything that, uh, that goes along with that, uh, it's really exciting what's taking place. And we're, you know, just like when the Internet began, um, we're now evolving into like the IoT areas and how we can communicate to individual devices throughout a building facility. And but as we know right now, it's still at the beginning, but we are able to put in systems that can be able to future proof and uh, be able to tie into these different uh, technologies as they advance. So when you tie in, when you talk about that as a utility type company, an electrical company, is it important for you to use the internet of things as you describe as something that really grows and connects your customers and the way you're doing things in a unique way? How do you do that? Well, you know, I'll be totally honest with you. Uh, the Internet of Things is still new to us, and we're still learning that whole process. But as we've, as we've been hearing and what we've been noticing out there is there are those uh, ability to be able to communicate to and mine that data to be able to perform and create better opportunities within a, a, a facility or a, any kind of commercial project or residential project or anything that's going on in, uh, in our industry. So how has that changed from what you see? Because right now the Internet of Things is driving things differently. So how is that changing the way you see, the way you work and deliver things to your customers from how you've changed your business or how you see your business changing? Well, you know, we have to evolve. As a company, we have to be able to figure out what's taking place and be on the cutting edge of that, uh, that new technology. And like I kind of referred to before, I. We we want to get that get involved in that because we see all this opportunity that's taking place and it's the future. It's here, um, but it's at its infant state, and we're going to figure out how to best take advantage of that technology for our future for our company. Um, as as you might know, um, this unity thing that we've come up with is now just starting to take place within our company structure. Let's talk about some examples of that, that unity that you describe. Are there examples that will help our viewers understand what you guys are doing? Well, you know, really it starts, it starts with education. And the education behind this is really essential. And it, and it starts with the owner, and then it goes to the architect, goes to the engineering firms, then it goes to the uh, general contractor. And when we talk about unity, we're talking about coordination. We're talking about tying all these different apparatuses that we have, the communication, the lighting controls, the BAS controls, the electrical, and bringing them together in a construction uh, building. And the real key here is with that coordination, we're doing it with one company that's able to supply this, this uh, type of uh, uh, unity that can really make 
a building system shine. And, I, and, and really, essentially, it's going to create value. It's going to change energy savings. It's going to create all these different nice things that in less redundancy, really important because you essentially in our in our industry, what's taking place is there's a lighting control contractor, there's a fire and alarm contractor, there is an electrical contractor, there's a BAS contractor, and they're all fighting over each other in a construction site to create uh, what we're trying to do with unity. So and to some. So and to summarize this, how do you put it all together? What's the best way that you would summarize what Unity is? Unity is a coordinated effort with one company putting all these different entities together and creating one platform. So what happens is when you create one platform, you're making it easier for the facility managers. You're, you're making it easier for the owners. You're making it easier for the general contractor as well. Glenn, thank you for being with us and joining us today on Someone You Should Know. Thank you so much. Have a great day. With the rise of industrial, residential, and even commercial construction projects, new materials and technologies are being introduced every day. This is so vital to surpass construction timeline. Now a new construction innovation zone looks to connect startups with global construction companies. This is helping create this community to drive innovation. Here to talk with me about it is Uzi Sheffer, CEO of SOSA. Uzi, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Susie, let's talk a little bit what's been going on. How did you guys actually start SOSA and what's that all about? Well, SOSA is a global network of uh, innovators uh, that basically uh, um, help startups with access to investors and to the global market. And on the other side, provides corporations with direct and first access to innovation. Uh, it all started in, uh, in Tel Aviv. We opened the doors about uh, three and a half years ago. Um, it's a unique uh, platform and collaboration between uh, uh, the people, the pioneers and leaders of the high-tech industry in Israel. So managing partners of the biggest VCs, funds, uh, angel investors, serial entrepreneurs, um, top executives in the industry. They created this place together so that the entire ecosystem has a place where it can come and, uh, and do business. And right now, when you look at that in Tel Aviv, you have a lot of great startups when you're looking at things that are happening in construction. Let's talk about that right now. Yeah, so um, so construction, uh, basically construction is, a, is an industry and a vertical where we, in the last year, year and a half, have identified a huge opportunity for entrepreneurs and for investors. So uh, what would be the challenge for the traditional industry would be an opportunity for uh, investors and uh, for entrepreneurs and the purpose uh, of the program that we launched is really to bridge the gap between the high-tech industry and the construction industry now in israel these are the two largest industries with uh, with very little connection and very little synergy between uh, uh, between these two industries i would i would uh, uh, um, uh, think that in many other countries in the world it's uh, it's quite the same and and the construction industry uh, with all its supply chain, starting from planning, constructing, uh, inspecting, and the regulators as well, they have uh, huge pain points where we already see technologies today that can solve many of these problems. That, that was the background, basically, so are you, for launching this program. Are you seeing a lot of use of innovative technology? You're seeing these great new startups with these young millennials who have creative ideas of applying technology? So... It's a mix. It's a mix. We already see startups coming up to solve problems in this industry. But one of the purposes of the program that we launched is to bring these two industries together so that more entrepreneurs form startups for this industry, so that investors can hear firsthand from the industry the pain points and challenges and then have more confidence in the solutions where entrepreneurs come to raise money for and where we also, as facilitator and as the operator of the program, can also help startups pivot their product from other industries to this industry. Because 
anything which is supply chain management, predictive analytics, predictive maintenance, uh, all the world of big data, uh, AI and machine learning that can be used for planning and automated planning for maybe 80 or 90 percent of the process. These are all technologies that exist. Uh, everything which is, uh, um, well, we already see uh, startups today based on drones, for example. So autonomous drones, either measuring or performing automated inspections uh, that save a lot of uh, manual work effort and, 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 uh, and, uh, and are able to identify errors in the construction in nearly real time. So it's a mix of existing solutions that need help to get to the construction industry and providing access to the construction industry, to technologies, while supporting the formation of new startups. So do you see a lot of, when you talk about this, uh, the advancement of machine control, artificial intelligence, these kind of technologies being blended with this creative development of these startups, taking technology to places beyond what we use already in BIM and some of the technologies in the supply chain to things we haven't even thought of right now? Yeah, so we see the, the entire mix. And, and I can share with you that for us, we are a very result-oriented platform. So we also, we, it's important for us to see results in the first year of operation when we start innovation programs in certain industries. So we onboard startups and solutions which represent a mix of quick wins or solutions that are easy to implement, anything from uh, project management, which, which can optimize a lot, a lot of the work of, of construction companies. And, and through, uh, let's say, mid-level uh, difficulty for implementation, autonomous drones, up to more disruptive stuff that will probably be implemented two, three years ahead, like uh, 3D printing, which are startup that are startups that are a combination of uh, materials, hardware, and software, and uh, and more complex uh, um, startup in in the world of big data. Have you had some successes right now with a few startups that you're seeing really start to take shape? We launched the program two months ago, and and one of the company one of the company uh, um, building which is actually creating a, a marketplace and an ecosystem for developers and future residents to communicate and engage uh, one with each other. Have already a, a pilot, a signed pilot with a project with three thousand uh, residential units. So uh, so that's great, and uh, and uh, we will see more coming in the upcoming months. Uzi, can you explain how this also all got started? Yeah, so actually this program is backed by the Israeli government, by the Ministry of Housing and the Ministry of Economy, and by the Israeli Builders Association. Um, the government involvement in sparking innovation in Israel is a model that had been uh, successfully implemented in the automotive industry, for example, and now the government is looking for additional verticals um, to support the creation of technology communities. Um, they chose as SOSA um, to uh, run this program uh, because that, that's our business. So we connect supply and demand in different traditional industries. Well, I think it's really exciting. How can our, list, our viewers here that we have get in touch with either on being investors or actually wanting to be a part of the startups? So they are very welcome to get in touch with us. Just go online to our website, SOSA, that's S-O-S-A dot C-O. And we have a page for the construction tech program and we'll be happy to get in touch. Uzi, thank you so much for being with us today. We appreciate all your time. That's our innovation and technology. Thanks again. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Welcome to Got a Tool. We talk a lot about tablets, technology, cell phones, and all kinds of other work tools for the construction job site. But the question remains, how do you carry all of these new gadgets at the job site? The good news is there are new products designed to help you hold everything hands-free. And Dan here is gonna help me test one of those today. So I have this tablet belt clip that I want to show you right now that's a heavy duty belt from Runner Mobile Tech Gear. Now we're going to walk through how this is going to hold your tablet and it's really interesting. So Dan, why don't you show us how this Velcro heavy duty belt works. You attach it and then you actually are going to buckle up this belt, see if you can see how you're doing that. And then why don't you show us where the tablet is hooked up right here and now unclip it so as you can see the tablet is actually 
in that Velcro back there. Now it's connected right there. Now I want you to hook, bulk, buckle it back up there. There you go. Now unbuckle it. Now I want you to drop it. Now what's really nice is it's attached to this clip. So if you were to drop it, you're not going to lose it. And that's really great. I love the way it does that. Why don't you buckle it back up? So you can see the whole time that if you're on the job site, you're hands-free. Now they also have another one that either can hold your tablet or it can hold a mini for maybe a smaller one for us ladies who might want to, don't want to wear something that's so heavy like that. And I would put this over. It's a little bit sling like this. A little bit easier, I can put my hands, maybe not quite as attractive as a purse, but something simple and easy that we would have right here that I think is kind of nice. So you could have that. They also make other products so that you can carry your phone or other things. So they have a lot of different things to help you keep your hands free. So when you're at the job site these days, you need to be able to have your hands free to do all the things that we're doing at the job site. A tool belt or a sling for all your tech gadgets, well, would you like it? Well, that's really up to you. That's your Got a Tool for today. This segment is sponsored by ECI Mark Systems. Home builders, listen up. Connectivity is changing your projects. But with technology, what should you be thinking about in the buildings that you're putting up? Today, I'm going to walk you through the top technology you should be incorporating into your new builds. I believe there are four key areas that home builders need to consider. So let's walk through each of them on the show today. First up, sustainability. Homes are responsible for a significant amount of energy use. Buildings in general account for 40% of the national CO2 emissions. LEED certified buildings consume 25% less energy and 11% less water. Retrofitting just one out of every 100 American homes with water efficient fixtures could avoid 80,000 tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Now think about that. Technology exists to improve energy efficiency. Some of the most highly sought among home buyers include thermostats, light bulbs, lighting, and even appliances. We've been seeing this transformation in the market as of late. Companies such as Nest have entered the market with these unique products, which we all know has been later acquired by Google. But still, Nest has really helped redefine thermostats. Now, new technologies have emerged. And for instance, many of the big box retailers are offering solutions for the home. One example is Iris from Lowe's, which offers a complete smart home management system. These solutions are evolving. And as home builders, you have an opportunity to put these types of technologies in your new homes. The next area is security. I've been watching this area for quite some time and see some big growth on the horizon for the residential market. Many of the analysts agree, suggesting a 10% growth rate through 2017. Consumers are willing to pay for greater security in their homes and the technology as it continues to advance. Be prepared to put whole home control, alarms, and security systems in your new homes. Some big examples come to mind are Alarm.com and even ADT Security. Still, there are others that are looking to take a share of the market, and these include Scout Alarm, Cocoon, and even Canary. The bottom line here is that buyers want greater security, and you must deliver. The third tech trend that I see really emerging today is convenience, and this is a bit newer than some of the others that we've discussed. With the advent of Alexa, buyers really want these virtual assistants. And many reports kind of predict this intelligent virtual assistant market will grow in the next decade or so. Many of these systems, such as Alexa, are sold direct to all of us consumers. But this is still a trend that home builders should really keep an eye on. So all of you really need to pay attention to this because these virtual systems will connect the home to all of our lighting, the thermostats, smart door locks, and all the things that we have in the houses. So these assistants will be able to help control the whole home. 
And this is the case with what Meritage Homes did. The company was able to connect all of the home automation features to connect the speaker control devices such as Alexa, Claire, Nexia, even Google Home, and so many other things. So these virtual assistants will be central to being able to control the connected home. The final tech trend to keep an eye on is entertainment. Now this includes audio video, theater, and other systems that bring entertainment into the home. Homeowners want to be able to listen to music, they want to watch their TVs, movies, or even YouTube seamlessly. So technology really is enabling all of this to happen. So whole home automation systems can help connect everything in the home. So this now includes lighting, thermostats, security systems, doors, HVA systems, so much more. The technology is really here. Home buyers want it. Will you be putting all of this in your next home? That's your Learn It for today. This segment is sponsored by Leica Geosystems. Machine control is our word of the day, or should I say, words of the day. In construction, this is used to accurately position equipment. But did you know this technology has its roots in manufacturing? The earliest version of the computer numerical control was developed shortly after World War II. It was developed to manufacture more accurate parts for aircraft. But by the 1950s, the technology had advanced, and there is enough data to indicate practical possibilities in other industries, such as what we're talking about today in construction. Today, the technology can be used for automated motion control, and this means a system of devices can manage, command, direct, and even control the behavior of other devices and even systems. That is the de definition we most commonly use for machine control today. In construction, this means accurately positioning equipment based on models and GPS systems. A machine can be guided based on the data it receives. So this includes moving an electric or hydraulic motor. And it also includes grade control. So machine control has changed how work is performed at the construction job site and as it increases productivity, we are seeing per improvements to the technology. Today, machine operators can leverage advanced controls to position equipment so much more accurately, and that is leading to even greater technology advancements in machine control. So think artificial intelligence, advanced learning, and even intelligent machines. This could help take machine control to the next level in construction. Machine control, that's your word for today, or should I say words? And thank you for watching Construct Tech TV, where we are talking tech at the job site. <music>